I'm getting this spun up. You guys have any questions about what we just talked about or any other wonderings? Okay. Uh, again, interrupt me if uh, if you guys want or if I'm not making sense. Okay, so then um, I'm gonna try to go through this next part kind of fast. Um, so impacts. Again, the hurricane itself has some direct impacts in, in degradation of the environment. Um, and we can see that here, this is an island that is messed up. We can see that these areas before the hurricane hits, now this is a river right here, okay? We can see that before the river, or sorry, before the river hits, before the hurricane hits, there's a, there is natural components here. So here's this, this is salt marsh, we're looking at our wetland. See, we have this natural sinuosity going on, but then we have this stuff. This ain't natural. This thing ain't natural. So these are, particularly this one here, this is an oil and gas extraction effort. So people have gone in, they've dug out the salt marsh, piled up the, the sediment here to make it rot, raised up and be dry. So they can then barge in oil and gas operations um, and they can essentially have a tractor right here and sort of pull a barge along this parallel canal. Uh, legally, they're supposed to fill that in when they're done, essentially almost none of them have ever done any of that. There's been some lawsuits uh, to the tune, try to deal with that. And so in response to lawsuits, the state of Louisiana changed the, changed the laws to say you cannot sue oil and gas companies for failing to restore areas they, they promised to restore, which is pretty crazy if you think about what I just said, but that's going on there. Okay, so, so Katrina exacerbates wetland loss. And again, wetland losses or wetlands are this key buffer, this key speed bump as hurricanes come on land that are gonna help slow things down, cut off the water supply, the hot water that's fueling the hurricane. So the more coastal wetlands we have, the less intense hurricanes are gonna be by the time they hit your house or your city or your, your infrastructure. So let's take a look at one example of these barrier islands, the Chandelier Islands. So here again, here's New Orleans where the bend is, here's Lake Pontchartrain, here's the Bird, Birdsfoot Delta. And so these are these, these this outlying, you know, sandy barrier islands, and we'll zoom in on this area. So this is what they look like. So the ocean, most oceanward areas are usually sand, sand and sand dunes, with the, the more stable dunes and the vegetation, like salt marsh type vegetation, is going to be on the leeward side of those islands. So here's a zoom in of this one spot. Here's a zoom in of this other spot. Now the yellow arrows are reference points. So these photos come from before Hurricane Katrina, and these photos are just immediately after. And so you look at all that wetland that's been that's been just scoured away. So this is not high tide, and when the tide goes out, it's going to come back. This wetland is all gone, thanks to that that scour. Now hurricanes have been hitting for millions of years, and you know billions actually, but you know long, long time, and they've been scouring vegetation for a long, long time. So this. This in and of itself isn't evil, but on top of all the other stressors that we are engendering, on top of all the other problems that we're causing to these coastal wetlands, this is, is really difficult to stomach when this happens. We also see a lot of loss through wind shear. So this is an area, again, this was all uh, closed canopy, or this was all uh, you know, emergent salt marsh, basically. Um, but now it's all been ripped out, and so, We've one lost that amount of wetland, but then also it's going to be much easier for the wind to rip because now the wind can blow all this and rip. Whereas before, if it was like this, it's harder for the wind to get a purchase, right? We talked about like the, the, those nucleating centers, the nutria start. So hugely problematic. Right after Katrina, uh, a couple weeks later, so Katrina hits basically the eastern part of Louisiana. Hurricane Rita hits the western part of Louisiana. Hurricane Katrina goes relatively fast. Hurricane Rita goes relatively slow, more like a Harvey situation. And so this is Holly Beach that we went and checked out uh, on my first trip there in the wake of the storm. So this is, this is a very low-lying area. Again, flat land, pancake land. And this is essentially a place where folks that aren't particularly wealthy can have a summer home. So people that might live inland for a ways. So this is this is uh, more of a seasonal residence area, but for people that don't have a lot of means. This is what it looked like in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. So again, top is before Katrina, 
bottom is after, essentially everything is gone. So this is LIDAR data, the green, those are all houses on the right. And then essentially everything is gone after it. So this is when we went to look at it, uh, you know, almost a year later, this is what you see. So the, the stop signs had gone back up because there was a federal fund to redo the stop signs. The power lines have been restrung, but there's nothing here. You have a fire hydrant in the middle of nowhere, right? This was a house, this was a house, this was a house, this was a house. You see somebody here has a trailer that's probably rebuilding, but essentially the entirety of this community is scoured away and no longer exists. Um, crazy amount of devastation. Human dominated system, as we mentioned, we talked about the uh, uh, oil and gas, et cetera. This is a LIDAR map of the elevations of New Orleans. Again, the hotter the, the color, the higher the elevation, the cooler the color, the lower. And so there, there's a lot of the this, this, this city that's at problematic elevations. So again, here's New Orleans. Let me draw a picture for you guys. This, this, is a, this, is a, this isn't an island, but in many cases, it functions like an island when the hurricane comes. On this side, we have obviously Lake Pontchartrain. There is this thing, a super, 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 super long bridge. It's called a causeway. So this is the causeway that goes from this side, the south side of Lake Pontchartrain all the way over the north side. During Katrina, that collapsed. You could not drive on it. So, you know, theoretically, you can get out of the city by going north. Uh, you, you can cross the bridge going south. But, you know, if the bridge has a problem, you have a river here. If this causeway has a problem, you have a lake here. So you, 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 you're not technically on an island, but in many cases, it functions like an island in a disaster situation. In many cases, what, what folks do in the case of hurricanes, and we have just begun to do this in the case of wildfires in California, is use this approach called contra flow. So when we're trying to evacuate people, instead of using just the northbound lanes or just half of the lanes on the freeway, the idea is you shut down all incoming vehicles or all incoming traffic, excuse me, and all the lanes, say both the north and the southbound lanes, all become northbound lanes. So you're able to flood everybody out as fast as possible in, in, as the disaster is approaching, as the storm is approaching, as the wildfire is approaching, what have you. But in the case of New Orleans, really the main part of the city is, is sort of like a bowl. And here's, an, here's a cross section. I already mentioned this to you guys, but here's the Mississippi River. So this, this light blue is Mississippi River, Mississippi River, dark blue, Lake Pontchartrain, Lake Pontchartrain. As I mentioned before, Lake Pontchartrain is at sea level. The river is higher. And so uh, the problem is the city, much of the city is below uh, sea level. And so, um, the, the error that people think is that the Mississippi River levee failed. It did not fail. The Lake Pontchartrain sides of the levees um, are, were, were compromised. That's what went wrong. So again, just, just real quick, I can just show you this. This is just an animation just doing elevational step through. So this is zero meters, this is regular sea level, one meter of sea level rise, two meter, three meter, et cetera. So you can see how shallow everything goes away. With a couple meters sea level rise, the city is essentially disappeared. Um, so we go there, if you guys are interested, you can come. So we were originally doing rebuilding. Now, most of the stuff in our human dominated areas, we install food gardens and we do a lot of wetland restoration to try to help that, help restore some of that speed bump between the city of New Orleans and the ocean. It used to be here, 64 miles from the city of New Orleans or the edge of the city of New Orleans proper to the Gulf of Mexico. So the hurricanes had to come over 64 miles of vegetation. Now it's 14 miles to get to open water. So, <clears throat> so with climate change, with, with loss of coastal buffering, these hurricanes are basically right on you super quickly. So our efforts are to support our friends there to try to make more of a buffer and, and as an ancillary benefit, better habitat for birds, more habitat for vegetation, more, better recreational opportunities for folks, all that kind of good stuff. Um, 2005 was the first year this happened. Let me show this video. Was, was the first year it happened. And last year um, was too dramatic, this, this stuff. How can I turn down? this sound here. Um, hmm. 
Um, I don't know how to kill this sound on this bad boy. This is going to be bad. Um, so I'll just I'll just sort of advance as fast maybe. So this is um, a great video. This is an animation from NASA, um, but this is all the storms. So this is stepping through uh, the year of Katrina, and we're going to see this. So this is sea surface temperature. This is the warm water. It's going to fuel those hurricanes, right? And as we step through, we start seeing hurricane form. There's Arlene, right? There's Brett coming up, Cindy. And so we start stepping, through the, start stepping through the alphabet. And um, 2005, an average year for six hurricane. Wow, there's some lag here. Anyway, so, okay, so, so these are all the hurricane tracks that are popping up, right? So the World Meteorological Organization establishes the names. There's a whole history on that, which we could talk about if you guys want. Um, sexist history and all kinds of other things but but um for the last uh 50 years or so we've alternated between men's names and women's names and the 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 um for the atlantic storms here um it, it's going to vary for all the countries potentially impacted they get to nominate they get to submit a list of names so we have a mix of names from mexico and from Canada, North America, and Belize, and Cuba, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we have a list that goes through A through Z. We never ran out of Z until 2005. Then we had to start going to alpha, beta, et cetera. And so that was the first time it was all kinds of news. And oh my God, we ran, there's so many storms, we ran out of names for them. Um, and uh, 2020, uh, this happened again. So you might think, I wonder why we don't do things differently. When Katrina was making landfall, um, as measured in this part of Mississippi, 30 foot high storm surge, huge storm surge. Um, uh, you know, again, and in and, and the difference in elevation here, maybe your house is at 10 feet above sea level or 20 feet, right? So 30 foot is incredibly high uh, storm surge. That's some stuff I could show you, but we're getting low on time. Um, uh, this is an example of some of the flooding. So here we go. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, this is, okay, zoom in here. So this is um, uh, dry land. And what you see here is for, in some cases, the roofs are damaged, right? So we do have, do definitely have some roof damage, but lots of the roof, like, so this is damp, this is roof damage here. So if it rains, it would go inside the building. But, um, but, you know, some have damage, but most of what's going on here is the inundation. So most of the impact, most of the cost from New Orleans is coming from flooding. Now, one of the aspects about our insurance, as I discovered when my house flooded the other couple of weeks ago with a pipe break, um, your insurance is going to cover you for specific things. So this is what happened with New Orleans. What happened with New Orleans is um, so if your roof blew off in the wind, your insurance company is going to cut you a check, right? Again, most of this damage isn't that. Most of this damage is, is in a low area, you got inundated, right? So you go to your insurance company, I got flooding. Oh, what happened? How, how did you flood? Well, what's your elevation? Oh, my elevation is this. Oh, it flooded because the federal levy breached. And then you say, uh, okay, well, it's still flooded. So can I have a check? No. The wind ripping off your roof is a so-called act of God, right? Something you couldn't control. The flooding that flooded your house, that was bad engineering. So we're not, so the insurance company's like, that, that ain't us. You know, so we don't, we, we don't look in your contract. We don't have to pay for that. So now people have been paying all this money for insurance. They were told they didn't need to get, uh, you know, flood insurance. Why? Because they were behind the flood protection barrier and the federal government was guaranteeing them. The federal government's protection just failed. So what are you going to do, right? It's a catch-22. So this is a key piece of evidence here to explain what happened. Uh, this, I'm, so I didn't take this picture. It's unbelievable the person that took this picture lived. It's, it's hard to believe this person lived. So, okay, so this person is, is, in New Orleans, looking towards Lake Pontchartrain, okay. So this is the this is the uh, causeway. This is this is the um, this is the bridge thing, and 
um, it looks like a tidal wave is coming in. What's going on is the ocean, the storm surge has lifted up, okay? And you cannot see the levee because the water is flowing over the top of the levee, okay? So doing nothing else, uh, just with the wind, the levees are, are water is coming over the levee. If that's all that had happened, that would have been horrible, but it would have been kind of okay, right? Because it would have, if this is only for a few hours, right? So water flooding in, oh my God, water flooding in. And then as the eye migrates north, then we'd be, then we'd be good, right? Then it would stop, the storm surge would go down, it would stop flooding over. But that's not what happened. All kinds of issues happened. Uh, here's but one. This is my favorite is a hard word to use in this context. This is, this is the one I like to use a lot. Uh, okay, so now uh, we are, so, sorry, I'm going fast. Am I making sense? Everybody keeping up with me? You guys have any questions so far? That's good. Okay. Okay, so, um, uh, so my butt is to, my back is to the city of New Orleans. I'm looking north. We're looking north. Lake Pontchartrain is up here. This is one of those drainage canals. So behind me, right, behind my back, is one of those pump houses that's going to be pumped where the wood pumps are. That's going to be pumping the water, dumping it into this canal. And this canal is going to drain, normally drain the water all forward away from us into Lake Pontchartrain. Everybody with me? This is a levee. So levee is a mound of dirt, okay? Levee could be natural, could be artificial. In this case, it's artificial, but, but that's what a levee is, okay? Then we've added on what's called a flood wall. A flood wall is this thing. So the idea here is we could have a big, huge levee that's this tall, but for, for engineering reasons, geometric reasons, if we wanted the, the, the levee to be this high, the toe would be really far over here, right? The best thing to have is a levee. But in many cases, because we want to put a railroad uh, right here, we want to put a house right here, we want to put power plant here, whatever. It's hard because to make that levee that big, as tall as you want, it's going to take up a lot of land. So we often resort to topping it off with a flood wall. Okay. If well engineered, if well designed, that can work well. But check this one out. Uh, so this is one of the few places that didn't get totally nuked in terms of the flooding. It did get flooded, but only during the uh, storm surge. Why? Because the water came up and it, it's, it's supposed to be this tall, if you guys can see this. I, I know this sounds crazy. It doesn't sound real. It sounds like some kind of weird Hollywood movie, but this is, this is the truth. So we have this big giant flood well that you paid for that all of us paid for with federal dollars to ensure the safety of the city. We paid for, you know, in this case, miles and miles and miles of this flood wall here. And then it just stops. And there's about a, I don't know what it is, 30 foot gap or so, 30, 40 foot gap between here and my back. My back is the brick, brick of the pump house. So what happened was when all that, all that water flooded in and, and, and it sort of reverse course shot up this, uh, as water raised up, it, it, it flooded this area by flooding over this, like a waterfall out of here. So it flooded down here. But then once the storm surge passed, it left. So then, then these went to, so th this didn't fail because this was sort of like a safety valve. But it wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be a safety valve, right? It was supposed to be fit. It was supposed to be a continuous thing. In this case, um, they essentially opted to not finish building the wall. Just opted not to finish building the wall. Um, and then uh, and the, things get crazier and crazier from here on out. Um, I'll, I'll have a, a slide in a second to show uh, examples here. But, but in general, getting to uh, uh, Joe's or whoever it was question about environmental impacts, with all these disasters, the environmental impacts are always hard to figure out because we're rarely able to get in. Initially, all the concern is understandably with getting people, getting them stabilized, getting them safe. But looking at the ecological priority is really low. In the case of Katrina, most of the game wardens and the environmental specialists were retasked to evacuating people and, and sort of first responder status. 
So there really weren't even people there that could do stuff if, if we wanted to. Um, we see a huge spike in gas prices across the nation because we shut down. So whenever a hurricane comes in, we shut down all these offshore gas wells so, you know, for safety and stuff. And it takes a while to turn them back on. And so that leads a, that causes a huge spike in prices. The next thing that comes along is we start to assert more strong control, in this case with the National Guard. And uh, the National Guard come in and start to start serving as security and start some of the immediate cleanup. Um, we start to plug the holes. So here's a helicopter driving, dropping sandbags to plug that, the breached levee here. Here, these guys are dumping gravel and trying to seal it up that way. Same thing with this one. And then once they get those holes, but this guy's using a barge and sort of dumping um, uh, sandbags. And once we get all these holes patched, then you hook up pumps and start pumping the water out. Um, initially, environmental concerns are all about pet rescue. So help my bunnies, help my dogs, help my snakes, right? Helping, help my, helping our cats, right? That's what we deem. And then, and we hear this with every single disaster. This will, this, this seems to happen with all these disasters. Uh, then next is, um, ooh, danger, environment is bad. So uh, for example, here's the cases of West Nile virus, right? Which is a very serious disease, which was actually an invasive, it, it, it came from Africa, uh, first discovered in the early, in the late nineties. Anyway, so um, here's a case in January, here's a case in February. And we start to hit in the summer when it starts to explode. And here we go, we're starting to see more cases in Louisiana as is normal. But then all of a sudden, September, boop, no cases. Why? Why do we see no cases of uh, West Nile virus? Do you guys know in, in 2005? Any guesses? Because like the hurricane came in and there wasn't like still water for the- Oh, good guess, there? good guess, okay. good guess. But uh, pretty rapidly after it passed, passed through, there was way more water, actually. Is it because a lot of the people were gone? Uh, a lot of people were gone, but also all the monitoring was destroyed. So we don't have any cases because we weren't, nobody was able to measure it. So our, our, our intelligence gathering network just goes down. We usually monitor this with chickens. We have, we have chickens set out around. Um, uh, a city or a county or whatever, and we sample the chicken blood to look for, um, to see if there's presence, but all the chickens are killed. Then you'll start seeing stories about, ooh, all these snakes, these dangerous snakes, and there are a lot of snakes in Louisiana, I, I do have to admit that, but now they're in the water, right? Now they're all over the place. Alligators coming into town. Oh my God, alligators, right? The dogs that have been abandoned start to form packs, these wild packs, right? And they're hungry, right? So now there's a sort of threat. And then of course, the, the disease causing things. So people are so freaked out by this that they say, okay, we're, we're, we're letting all, we're relaxing all these environmental laws, just start spraying the hell out of everywhere. So to try to control the mosquito population. So one of my friends uh, who did his PhD in Louisiana, uh, this next summer, he goes out there and he says, uh, he goes and visits a friend of his sort of outside New Orleans. And he said, hot time of the year, sitting on the porch, screened in porch. And he's sitting there drinking a beer. I think it was a beer. It's something. And his friend goes in to get some food. And he's sitting there rocking in the chair going, oh, yeah, I love, love this place. And all of a sudden he get, got freaked out. And he said, and he couldn't figure out what it was. He said, something's really weird about this uh, post-hurricane landscape. And he's looking around and he can't put his finger on it. And then he realizes what it was, was there was a street light across the street from the house. Light, you know, pool of light coming down at night, no insects. And, and he realized what was missing was all the buzz of cicadas and insects. They'd so blasted all these insecticides everywhere because they're freaked out about mosquitoes that they nuked significant amounts of the native insect population. And he realized the, the weirdness was that they were missing all the buzz and the sound of life from the surrounding wetlands and stuff. Um, okay, uh, other things, industrial pollutants, all kinds of stuff. Uh, again, Joe asked about this link earlier, um, but there's hundreds of thousands of homes that could not be repaired. We had at least two major, major oil spills that in and of themselves would be national headline news. But on top of that, 
there's probably at least 100,000 uh, other sources of leaks, pipelines, uh, uh, gas stations, things of that nature. And the quote from the uh, Los, uh, Los Angeles, the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality, which is like their version of the EPA, of our California EPA, was everywhere we look, there's a spill. It all adds up. There's almost a solid sheen over the area right now. So for reference, the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill was about 400,000 gallons. This one, Murphy Oil, this one site spilled uh, a, a more than the Santa Barbara oil spill. Just one site in the midst of this whole crazy thing. Most of these were not well documented. Um, and so there's a huge amount of release. So there's something I, I could play you this, this quote, um, but we're almost out of time with this snippet. Maybe I'll, I'll do a little add-on video for you guys, but this is this gentleman talking about the Murphy oil spill in Chalmette, which is the area just the south of New Orleans where we usually stay. And he's talking about how his whole city was flooded under uh, a layer of oil as the refinery flooded. Um, all kinds of problems. Fecal coliform, because the sewage system has been compromised. Lots of lead in, in remnant soils that were flooded. As we already mentioned, oil and gas, all kinds of sewage plants, huge problems. So this is the levee system. Each of these little boxes, here's Lake Pontchartrain right here. Here is the river. And, the, and this is an exaggerated illustration of the levee protection system. Each of these boxes, squares, represents a break in the levee system dozens and dozens of breaks. So it was not one thing, it was not one little deal. It was not, oh, we failed in this part. There was catastrophic failure throughout the system. Many, 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 many points of failure. So this is telling you, this should tell you with any disaster, when we have this many problems, that there's something fundamentally wrong with how we are planning and preparing and, and getting ready to, to respond to a disaster if we have this many failings in our system, particularly one we've been working on for decades and having spent billions of dollars on. Um, okay, let's see, I'll talk about, yeah, I'll talk about, uh, I'll, 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 I'll just say that the levees failed in ways that are totally obvious. The Army Corps of Engineers claimed that they had no idea this could fail. This was all data from the Army Corps of Engineers from their own independent studies that showed that their things would probably fail this way and they were not reading their own reports. We also saw a large spread of invasive species in the wake of this disaster. Indeed, wildfires, we see the same thing. Um, this is one of our invaders that we've been monitoring. And so my student here is holding this stem. The, um, the year before, this plant had been about this high. So this tree grew this tall. This is Chinese tallow. Um, just in that one year. It was crazy, crazy uh, invaders were trying to. And so what we're working on is trying to make sure we restore natives to this swamp as opposed to make it a more akin to a bamboo or an invaded forest. We want to make it be old growth and, and robust native trees and stuff. Okay, so maybe we'll end with this factoid slide since we're just about out of time. So I just want to go through this and then we'll, we'll pause for the day. Um, so uh, key things here. So we, uh, Katrina killed a little, it's very difficult with all these disasters to get the robust numbers. Numbers originally dribble out, but it's hard to get the numbers, particularly in a disaster of the scale of this, because there were so many folks that were sort of on the margins of society. They were rapidly evacuated and maybe they didn't come back. So it gets hard to figure everything out. But the, the official death toll is uh, just over 1,800 people. Louisiana, which got the lion's share of the death and the lion's share of the impact, unfortunately, had uh, just shy of 1,500 people killed. And I should say, this is immediate people killed. This does not account all the people who get divorced, all the people that have mental health issues and then commit suicide, all the people that that are so stressed out, they get into a rage and beat somebody up and kill somebody, right? This is just the immediate, directly, clearly attributable uh, deaths. Um, it's about 1,500 in Louisiana. 40% uh, of those were drownings. About a quarter were you know, some, uh, hit by a, a log or something of that nature. Um, <clears throat> uh, oh, I forgot to put the heart, right? I think the heart was about, uh, heart attacks were about 20% or so. I, have to, I, should, I don't know why I left that number off. Um, Half, more than half were 74 years old. So our oldest members of our society bore the greatest burden and, and died more frequently. 
Um, there's still, to this day, there's over a hundred people that nobody can figure out where they are. Um, if they died, if they just relocate and change their name, whatever. Um, we evacuated 1 million people from Louisiana. Uh, uh, the only thing that was bigger or the only thing that is bigger now is, has been uh, some of our wildfire evacuations. But um, at the time, this was still a huge, you know, mobilizing a million people. It's crazy. Um, the, the direct damages are on the order of 135 billion. It's, probably, it's always more than that, but that, that's what the estimate is. Um, as I mentioned before, 90,000 miles, uh, square miles declared a federal disaster area. Severity, which is a measure of intensity plus size, this is tied for the third strongest Atlantic hurricane ever recorded. Um, uh, when, it, when it made landfall, it was going 140 miles per hour. Ultimately, 80% of New Orleans flooded with 70% of all housing stock flooded. And, um, and the feds pumped in on the order of about 120 billion, uh, or, 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 or yes, about $120 billion came in um, to the response all told. Um, so that's Katrina. Um, and we could talk about the aftermath, but, but, but that is in detail um, a very strong hurricane and, and, it, and a huge, um, uh, I, I, th I think, I think a, a modern tablet and a modern um, uh, map for how long-term disasters can play out. So something like an earthquake that we might have here in Southern California can play out. Something like a massive typhoon hitting Bangladesh would probably play out. So there's, there's the immediate response that we tend to focus on, the initial stuff, but then there's this huge long tail of, of, of getting people out, getting people safe. How do we recover? What do we prioritize? Where do we find the money? How do we rebuild, et cetera? And all of these things are at play. And so we're seeing some of that with COVID now in terms of like the, the how we deal with stuff, how we prioritize, how we organize, and what we're learning with the COVID, what we learned with uh, the Katrina example is, you know, planning is key, preparing is key. We can't stop these events, but with clear um, maps, clear responses, clear protocols, we can respond more justly, more fairly, more, more rapidly, and, and in so doing, um, blunt, we, we can never stop these things, but we can blunt some of the worst of the worst impacts. If we fail to plan, if we have poor political leadership, if we have poor response planning, if we have uh, the, the emergency responders not, not uh, staged and ready to go, we're going to see more folks die. We're going to see greater ecological impacts. We're going to see greater burdens placed on those members of our society that are least able to respond. And so all of that is a reason to be better, uh, to have better knowledge about disasters and to be able to respond uh, more quickly. And with that, I guess I'll pause talking about uh, Katrina. So thanks, you guys. Are we continuing uh, hurricane?